Colors, poof! Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
See my necktie? That's the way your necktie should look. I don't tuck mine in in this uniform, I don't tuck it into the shirt like you do. But the knot, the button shirt up here, I do not want to see. There was a singer out here just a minute ago on the stage who had his shirt unbuttoned. Wrong. There was a singer out here on the stage a minute ago who had no necktie. Wrong. Okay, let's fix that problem. When you're an adult and you're going for a job interview or you're in a workplace and the uniform there or the dress code is coat and tie or necktie and you show up with a necktie that's not tied properly, that speaks volumes about you. At that point in time, your boss doesn't care what school you went to, what college you went to, what degree you have. It says something about your standards if you don't show up looking right. So let's fix that. Behaviorally, it's human nature to get excited around holiday periods and that's wonderful. That's why that's what holiday periods are for. But let's continue to behave to the proper standards here on this campus. We've had a few issues on that over the past weekend. And you know what I'm talking about, and I know what I'm talking about. So I'm challenging you to fix that problem. I look to the chain of command to assist and make this happen, and I look to each and every one of you to do your part and behave like mature, proper, 
respectful young men. Do I have a who on all that? Okay, thank you. Let's try it one more time. I detected a note of disrespect out there that I'm not going to tolerate. Do I hear a who on all that? Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to switch gears now to a much more positive thing. I am very excited today to have our guest speaker here today. Brigadier General Retired Daniel Kaufman is an incredibly accomplished person. And in just a moment, I'm going to read a short uh, biographical sketch of what his life is like. Um, he is a man of great energy, of great passion for what he does, and of great ethics and morals. And that is the message here today, is another perspective in a long series of speakers here at the school on how to lead your life to a very high moral, ethical standard. And this is a topic that is a lifelong study. You're never there. It's like golf. You're never perfect in golf and a lot of other sports. In terms of our quest to lead moral, ethical lives, we're never, we can never say we're there. We can always improve. And so the value and the benefit of great speakers like General Kaufman is to hear another perspective on how we can strengthen ourselves in this area. Called the, quote, absolute total package by General Retired David Petraeus, and, quote, one of the top five public servants of our time by General Retired Barry McCaffrey, Brigadier General Retired Daniel Coffin has spent nearly five decades as a soldier and a scholar, shaping generations of leaders from West Point and throughout the nation in all his various responsibilities to serve this country. After his graduation from West Point in 1968, he had a tour in Vietnam with the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. There he received a Bronze Star and two Purple Hearts for wounds that he received in combat. General Coffin returned from war and earned a master's degree at Harvard University at the Kennedy School of Government and later went on to earn his doctorate degree at MIT. So he graduated from West Point, Harvard, and MIT. Quite an accomplishment. And he began his highly respected career as an educator in uniform uh, at West Point as a faculty member and later a department head, culminating by serving as the 12th Dean of the Academic Board, the Dean of Academics at West Point. And since 1802, when that school was founded, during General Kaufman's tenure there, he was only the 12th Dean since 1802. So the deans have a long tenure at West Point for a good reason, and they pick the best and the brightest of all uh, for that very, very important position. As the dean at West Point, General Kaufman helped transform that academy uh, after 9-11, uh, securing funds for major new construction, and graduating 13 Rhodes Scholars and 12 Marshall Scholars during his tenure there. And it was also during his tenure that West Point was raised to, according to Forbes magazine, the number one public college in America. And this happened while he was the dean. Uh, General Coughlin was also instrumental in establishing uh, the military academy in Afghanistan. And upon his retirement uh, from active duty at West Point, uh, he became the uh, founding president of Georgia Gwinnett College, the first public college in Georgia to be established in over 100 years. And he took that from nothing, from a PowerPoint briefing, to today, George Gwinnett College has over 19,000 students in it. And oh, by the way, we're in the process of developing an agreement with George Gwinnett College that will benefit our graduates of Riverside Military Academy. More to come on that in the coming couple months. Um, and so General Coffin has been a great educator, a great soldier, a great scholar. But in my view today, he has a secret. And he's not going to, I don't think, he's going to say to us the verbiage that here's a secret I want to let you in on. And the secret, though, in my opinion, is when you spend some time around General Kaufman, he is a man that has worked hard, has served in every capacity he's been in as a servant leader, and he has a happiness about him. He has uh, a joy about him. He has an unbounded energy about him for life. That's his secret that we have to learn from today. The secret to a joyful, happy, guilt-free life through moral, ethical living. So it's my honor to introduce to you today, Brigadier General Retired Daniel Coffin. So
that phone gallery on. Can you hear me back there? Am I on back there? Yes. Okay, good. I'm not sure about the guilt free part, but I appreciate the, all the rest of that. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back to, back to Riverside. Um, if I can get my machine to work here. There we go. Um, what, the, what Colonel Gallagher didn't tell you is I'm presently the uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce down in the Gwinnett, the Gwinnett County, a uh, job about which I know nothing, uh, but which I'm having a great deal of fun. <laughs> so my first lesson to you is uh, life is always uh, one more great adventure. Uh, so when you think about that, uh, always always be looking for what's next. All right, come on. There we go. Right on. It's always great to be back at Riverside. Uh, I had the privilege of being on the board of directors here for about 10 years. Um, or some of y'all were born, actually, but nonetheless, uh, it's always good to be back uh, with, the, with, the talented, uh, with the talented directors. And so, um, what I want to talk to you about, and this uh, Colonel Gallagher alluded to this, is ethical leadership. Uh, because uh, you are going to be leaders in your society. Uh, you're going to be leaders in uh, government service, you're going to be leaders in military service, you're going to be leaders in academia, you're going to be leaders in business, you're going to be leaders in medicine. Uh, you're just going to be a leader in whatever area of endeavor you choose in the years and decades ahead. Uh, and so what kind of a leader are you going to be? Uh, and as uh, Colonel Gallagher indicated, I've been at this for about 50 years now. Um, and so what I've learned over the course uh, of that 50 years of public service of being on watch uh, is just a couple of principles that I want to share with you about the nature of being an ethical leader. So what are the characteristics of an ethical leader? What do you need to develop and continue to develop learn uh, during the course of your life to help you prepare yourself for positions and responsibility that you're going to hold in the years and decades ahead. Well, um, I've found the four that you see in front of you uh, to be most important, uh, and they're the principles that guide what I do uh, every day, uh, in which I've tried to live my life, and also the challenges that I've, that I've, uh, that I've undertaken. First of all, you've sort of got to be good at what you do, but you'll learn that. Uh, you'll go to college, you'll get a degree, you'll learn your technical competence uh, in whatever it is, whatever field you go into. But that's not enough, okay? It's necessary, but not sufficient. The four characteristics that you see beyond, uh, the, that you see there beyond competence are the ones that are gonna make you truly a leader of character, which is what you wanna be. And so you can see integrity, respect for others, which we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about, which is gonna be important for you all, responsibility uh, and engagement. Okay, so here we go. This is your honor code. Okay, it's word for word from the one. This is the, uh, uh, the, the monument to the honor code at U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Uh, it's the one under which you live here uh, at Riverside. Uh, Cadet does not lie, cheat, or steal, but tolerate those who do. Now, the first part of that's pretty easy. When we're growing up, we're taught by our parents, you don't lie, cheat, or steal. Uh, that, that piece uh, is the foundation of being uh, an ethical person. Uh, but the second part is a little tougher, isn't it? Uh, nor tolerate those who do. Uh, because we're also taught when we're growing up, you, you know, you don't rat on your buddy, you know, you snitch, right? You always take care of take care of your friend. I'm telling here to tell you that that's the hard part that you're going to confront um, in whatever walk of life that you go into, okay? Because you cannot tolerate uh, unethical behavior on the part of others, uh, and if you, you need to understand that, because um, I have seen it, unfortunately, personally, both in the army and in higher education and in business. Uh, that there are people who will mislead you, and you will make decisions based on what people tell you. Okay, as an army officer, you rely on the integrity of others. As a doctor, you rely on uh, the integrity of others to tell you what to do. People's lives literally depend on uh, you telling them the truth and other people telling you the truth. Okay, uh, and that's that's not an overstatement. And so. One, you have to be that ethical person, but more important, the second part of that phrase, which is the one that's hard to deal with, particularly when you're a young person, uh, is not to tolerate that kind of behavior in other people, okay? Because people's lives ultimately will depend on the decisions that you make, and you will make decisions based on uh, what other people tell you. Um, I'm gonna make one more point on this subject. If somebody comes up to you uh, and ask you to cover for them, basically to, be, to act in an unethical way so that they can get away with something. If somebody asks you to lie for them or to cover up for them or protect them from the consequences of their making a bad decision, guess what? They're not your friend. Okay? They are not your friend because they are willing to put you at risk to save their sorry butt. All right? So you need to remember that. Uh, 
be that kind of a friend. Be the one that says, hey man, you're screwing up, you're about to make a bad decision, uh, you need to straighten up. Uh, and oh, by the way, I'm not going to cover for you. That's being an ethical person. That's not being a snitch. That's not being a rat. That's not being a lousy friend. That's being a true friend. The flip side of that coin is if somebody asks you to ask him to act in an unethical way, they are not your friend. Remember that. Okay. So off we go. And you're saying, wait a minute, I've seen uh, plenty of opportunities, plenty of times around where we don't see ethical behavior on the part of leaders. And I've just given you a couple of examples that have ha happened around here recently. Some of y'all may be familiar with what happened in the Atlanta Public Schools uh, five, about five years ago or so. Uh, Atlanta Public Schools were hailed as the model for urban education in the United States because test scores across every demographic group were going up the market. Um, the superintendent of the Atlanta Public Schools was chosen to be the superintendent of the year uh, in, in America uh, for urban school systems. The problem was, uh, the reason those test scores were going up so much is not because the kids were learning so much more, it's because teachers were changing the answers on the test. You know, the standardized test that we inflict on you every year. Um, you know, instead of simply grading you, what would happen is dozens and dozens of teachers would get together with the grade sheet, the answer sheet, and simply change the answers on the student's test. And guess what? Uh, naturally, you know, the scores went up. And everybody knew it. The superintendent knew it. The leadership of the Atlanta Public Schools knew it. Dozens and dozens and dozens of teachers in the Atlanta Public School System knew it. Okay. Uh, a massive failure of personal and professional integrity. So what happened? The Atlanta Public Schools lost its accreditation. The superintendent was fired. Um, I mean, it just it had an enormous ripple effect on all of us in, a, in the regional and the best bottom of Atlanta area because when we're out around the world trying to recruit businesses to come to Georgia, um, the one thing that they know about when they hit Google in Atlanta Public Schools uh, is that scandal. Okay. So it really does have a long-term effect. Anybody from DeKalb County? I'm about to say something ugly about DeKalb County, so I'm by then, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Okay, well, all right. Fess up to it. Well, 15 years ago, DeKalb County was the place to be in Georgia. Uh, it, was, it was governed well. The school system was the model for others to emulate. Uh, its economy was booming. It was just the model for every other community in Georgia uh, to follow. Well, what happened? Um, got new members of the school board. Uh, ultimately, the Cab County Public Schools lost their accreditation. Why? Not because the kids weren't learning, uh, because the teachers weren't teaching, but because of malfeasance on the part of the school board. Now, the Cab County Commissioners, uh, they now held their commission meetings in the Cab County Jail, because that's where they all are, uh, because they were guilty of a number of different kinds uh, of infractions. And so, in, in fact, Emory University, you may have seen this in the newspaper, Emory University wants to secede from the Cab County. Okay? Uh, they are going to have a referendum that allows them to secede from the cab and become a part of the city of Atlanta. Okay. How did that happen? It happened because of the absence of ethical leadership. Very simple. In the school board and in the county commissioners, uh, they simply did not act uh, in ethical ways, and it had enormous consequences for that community. Um, in fact, uh, the city of Decatur uh, doesn't even admit it's in the cab county. Okay. And so, um, Actions have consequences. And I know you're saying, well, these are very senior people. Yes, they are. Uh, and that goes to what Colonel Gallagher said. Pursuit of ethical conduct, of ethical standards of leadership, is a lifelong pursuit. Okay? We all screw up. We all make mistakes. We're human, right? People will forgive you for screwing up. They will not forgive you for lying about it. It's that simple. Okay? Now, I don't recommend screwing up seven or eight times in a row, but um, if you lie to somebody uh, in order to avoid the consequences of one of your decisions. People will never forget it, and they'll never forget it. Um, your parents may have uh, bank accounts at Wells Fargo, which is a, uh, the old Wachovia bank that was taken over after the recession. Uh, now, in Wells Fargo, uh, people get promoted and paid based on the number of new accounts that they develop. Uh, and so what happened was, instead of going out and actually finding new customers, uh, members of the uh, employees at Wells Fargo just began to create fictitious bank accounts. And so they would take you, John Smith, and instead of having John Smith having one account, John Smith would have five accounts, even though John Smith only thought he had one. And so they created thousands and thousands and thousands of these ghost accounts that they were completely fraudulent. You know how many people got fired from Wells Fargo when that became public? 7,000. 7, Thousand employees of Wells Fargo. If you have a bank account there, and you might want to check it because you probably have like eight or nine you don't know about. 
lost their job. How is that possible? What does that say about the culture in that corporation? That 7,000 people would get fired for what is inherently unethical behavior. Okay? Um, and of course, uh, Equifax. Now, uh, y'all all have social security numbers, right? Well, your social security numbers are now public knowledge. 146 million American social security numbers, oh, and, and dates of birth and addresses and all the things that other people need to create a new you, uh, were hacked uh, because the company did not do what it was supposed to do in protecting its website. And so for the rest of your life, remember this, for the rest of your life, your social security number is going to be at risk because it's, it's in the digital world. It will, it will last forever. Uh, some 40 years from now, uh, we'll have your social security number, can find your address and your date of birth, which won't change, um, and can create a new you. Simply because uh, people at Equifax did not do what they were supposed to be doing. Okay? Personal hero of mine was the chief of staff of the Army named Gordon Sullivan. He always said very simply, do what's right because it's right. Not because somebody will know, not because somebody's looking over your shoulder, not because you'll get in trouble if you don't, but do it because it's right. You'll know if you do it wrong. You'll know if you're being unethical. So if you just make it a standard of life, make it one of the characteristics that defines who you are as a human being, to do what's right because it's right, tell the truth because it's what we do, regardless of the consequences. Again, people will forgive you for screwing up. Just walk in and say, I screwed up. They will never forgive you for lying about it. It is the foundation of leadership. It is the foundation of your relationships with the people that you're going to be engaged in for the rest of your life. Why is that? Because if people don't trust you, they will not follow you. It's that simple. And if people don't trust you, they will not hire you. They will not give you responsibility because they question your integrity. Right? So ethic, integrity is the foundation, of course, of uh, ethical leadership. Okay, second point. Respect for others. And this is kind of the flip side of integrity. But this is important. Who are those guys standing in the slot? Well, the guy in uniform was Lieutenant General Bill Lex, who was the superintendent uh, of the military academy. Uh, and the guy next to him is uh, a guy named Jack Reed, uh, Senator Jack Reed, who's the senior senator from the state of Rhode Island. They were both West Point class in 1971. Well, I'm West Point class in 1968, which means they were plebes when I was a senior. Okay? And in those days, hundreds of years ago, we were cadets. Uh, the plebe system was very different than it is now. It was a good deal more harsh. And so I got to know these two characters when I was a senior at West Point, and they were plebes. Um, in fact, uh, Senator Reed was in my company, and because Senator Reed and I are both men of normal height, uh, we stood at the same end of the formation. Uh, you know, down on the right end of every formation that we got into. And so I got to know him pretty well when he was a plebe, uh, and General Lennox uh, as well. So why am I telling you that story? Well, one, uh, because General Lennox ended up being my boss, he was the superintendent when I was the dean at West Point. Uh, Senator Reed and I actually became lifelong friends. We went to graduate school together and served in the Army together. Um, but the, life has a funny way of turning out. So that geeky kid down the hall, right, that you think is kind of a twerp, and he may end up being your boss. Or, more important, he may end up inventing the next Amazon or the next Google. Uh, and he may be somebody that you really want to know uh, and keep on good terms with. So, Respect for other people starts here, okay? because you live in a hierarchy. How do you treat people? Okay. Uh, now, why is that important? I'm going to tell you why it's important. Uh, these are some diversity numbers. Uh, 20 years ago, Gwinnett County, which is now the second largest county in the, in the state. 20 years ago, Gwinnett County was 90% white. Today, there's no majority race in Gwinnett County. Okay. So what? Why is that important? Well, because if you look at the demographics of the United States, what you see is in 20, what it says 2060, it's actually going to be before that. The demographics are down in Burnett today and pretty much in Hall as well. Look exactly like the United States is going to look in 20 or 30 years. So the rest of the country is going to look like us very quickly. Okay? I know you can't see that. What it says is, way back a long time ago, when I was born, America was 90 percent white. I will live to see no majority race, assuming I don't running the tree on the way back to work. Uh, I will live to see no majority race in the United States. Okay. And the America in which you're going to live and lead is the one that's on, sort of toward the right end of that, of that picture. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's what we look like today. And here's what your nation is going to look like in 2050. 
And you're thinking, boy, 25th is a long way off. No, it isn't. Be here before you know it. But more important, that's your America. That's the America in which you're going to be on watch. That's the America in which you are going to be leaders okay, in the years and decades ahead. So, why is that important? Can anybody name a single, successful, truly multi-ethnic democracy? Anybody? Right. There isn't one. You are going to create it. Not me. I'm going to be sitting in my rocking chair drinking a malted beverage, criticizing everything that you do. <laughs> but you are going to be all white. That's going to be your America. It's going to be the America that you make it for you, for your family, for your children, for my grandchildren. What's it going to be? What's that America going to be? Is it going to be an America in which we are all in it together? Or is it going to be an America of silence? The white American, African American, and Hispanic American, and Asian American. That doesn't work. Okay. Listen to me, gang. There's nothing providential about the continued success of this political experiment called the United States of America. It's going to take work on your behalf, on your behalf, on your part, to make it work. Okay. And that's why respect for others, particularly of people who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't go to the same church as you, who don't have the same ideas as you do. That's why respect is so important for the future of this country, current evidence notwithstanding, which is all the more reason to make it important today for you. Understand that we have to treat each other with respect. Because if we don't, we're going to come apart. It'll happen on your watch. This is Slavika. Uh, Slavika worked for me when I was the president of Georgia Grant College down in Lawrenceville. Slavika is from Bali. I can't, I didn't put her last, I don't know her last name. 12 letters long has no vowels in it, so I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Slavika is from Bali. And for those of you who studied your history, you might know, you probably might, you might not know, that um, in the at the end of the Cold War, what we used to call Yugoslavia sort of fell apart uh, into it, its varying uh, ethnic parts. And people who had lived side by side, literally for centuries, uh, of different ethnicities and different religions, people who had lived peacefully together for centuries, fell upon each other with unimaginable savagery. What happened in, in, uh, in Bosnia and Serbia uh, was simply horrific. It's the worst that humans can do to each other. And she saw it. Well, she immigrated to the United States in the late 1990s. Uh, and when we started the college, she came to work on our custodial staff. Slavika is basically a janitor. Right? When I got to work in the morning, Slavika was the first person I saw. She was already there. And when I went home at night, every night, Slavika was the last person I saw. She was still there. She took as much pride in doing her job as I did in mine, probably more. Uh, so if you threw a piece of paper on the campus at Georgia Grant College, she would chase you down in that golf cart and make you pick it up. <laughs> She's a woman of enormous dignity, deserving of enormous respect. She's a janitor. Okay. But she's a woman who has seen the very worst that people can do, and she brings with her a dignity that is simply impossible to describe every day. Come on, darling, you can do this. There we go. So how do you treat people? How do you treat people that work in the cafeteria? How do you treat the janitors around here? How do you treat the waitress who's going to give you the hamburger that's not cooked right when you go home for Thanksgiving vacation here in a, in a few days? Let me tell you something. If you treat people with respect, they'll never forget it. But let me really tell you something. If you treat people with disrespect, they really will never forget it. Okay? They will never forget it for the rest of their life. Trust me on that. So how do you treat people, particularly those uh, in whom you may have, uh, you may feel like they're in a superior position? Okay. How do you treat them? It's not the way you just fall your hand when it's not cooked, right? Okay. She didn't do it. Um, so don't blame her. Just say, hey, please, can you fix this? Don't treat the janitorial staff like they are not, not deserving of respect, because they have as much pride in their job as the president does in his. Okay. So remember that. All right, number three. When in charge, be in charge. It's about being responsible. Everything you need to learn about responsibility can be learned from Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Right? That's the original Star Trek series, long before any of you were born. 
Uh, no, those are crappy uh, things to follow. Uh, but Captain Kirk understood what it meant to be in command, as you can see. I am responsible for the actions of all the crew members under my command. When in charge, be in charge. Right? As opposed to the CEO of Equifax. <laughs> it was not my fault. Okay? Some guy down in the bowels of Equifax forgot to put a patch in that the FBI had told them two months earlier they needed to do, right? Because they were vulnerable, their, their systems were vulnerable. So for two months, this guy never walked down the hall to make sure that his patch had been supplied to protect the personal information of 146 million Americans. His response to the crisis, he's now the former CEO of Equifax, I might point out. Um, his departure, severance pay was. $90 million. Okay. So from giving away all your personal information, he's going to have to make it through life on your $90 million. That was his response to what he did. It was not my fault. Okay. That's not responsibility. That's not stepping up. Okay. All right. Anybody from Pennsylvania? No? Yes? All right. Anybody know the guy who the right this? Yes. Yeah. This guy named Jerry Sandusky, who was an associate athletic director at Pennsylvania State University, State College of Pennsylvania. Um, he was, uh, during the course of his tenure there, as an athletic director, an assistant athletic director. Uh, for a period of, of 15, almost 20 years, uh, he used the athletic facilities at Pennsylvania State University uh, to uh, basically to commit sex crimes against young men. Okay. Uh, so during the course of uh, his tenure there, uh, he, he was abusing young men, and everybody knew it. The senior coach at Penn State was a guy named Bill Paterno, uh, who was one of the most respected uh, coaches in America. He knew it. He did nothing because he did not want to besmirch the reputation of his program, of his athletic program, of his university. Anybody got the guys next to him is? His name is Graham Spanier. President of Pennsylvania State University, one of the most respected universities in the United States and indeed in the world. He was the president of that university. He knew, and he did nothing, because he did not want to damage the reputation of Pennsylvania State University. Well, what do you think happened to the reputation of Pennsylvania State University? Okay. They got hammered by the NCAA. They paid two and a half billion dollars in reparations to the families of the young men that uh, Mr. Sandusky uh, abused. Uh, Mr. Sandusky is currently enjoying uh, the air in the Pennsylvania State Prison System, uh, as he should. Um, and so, and oh, by the way, Sam Spanier was is under criminal indictment as well for failing to do it. So when you know, act. That's what responsibility is about. It's not about covering it up. There are no more cover-ups, okay? In the world of modern media, there are no more cover-ups. People will always know. Ask Judge Moore over in Alabama, okay? Uh, these events that happened 30 years ago are now public knowledge. So if you know, speak up. If you know, trust me, it'll come back. It'll come back. Okay, last one. Big finish. you got to be engaged. You cannot hope that things will turn out well. They will not. Okay. Success comes as a result of committed, dedicated leadership, and engagement on your part, okay? So, um, there's an old saying, of course, that everything happens for a reason. Sometimes, the reason that you're stupid is make bad decisions. <laughs> now, you say, wait a minute, that's a little rude. Let me tell you the, the history of this particular song. My wife and I were having uh, lunch at the country cafe uh, in North Georgia uh, some, some while ago, and this was a little sign that was on the wall in that, uh, in that restaurant. I thought, you know, I'd get a lot of talks to young people. And that's right, okay? If things do happen for a reason, sometimes it's because we make bad decisions. Uh, really bad decisions. You know, not, gee, I didn't study enough in my history test, although that's a bad decision. Uh, but if you make life choices, they're not good, okay? So remember that, uh, that sometimes you just make bad decisions. So hope. You now, gee, I hope my girlfriend doesn't help me for that doofus down at Greater United Christians, okay? Right? Uh, gee, I hope we get into a good college. 
gee, I hope I get to be um, a doctor, a lawyer, a stockbroker, you can see it, playing the NFL, or if you really like to be on the It doesn't happen because you want to be it. It doesn't happen because you hope to be it. It happens because you work hard to prepare yourself uh, and make it happen. So where are you going? Where are you headed? Are you a good role model to your other cadets and your peers? Uh, are you a good role model to your seniors? Are you a good, are you a good role model to the seventh grader down, down the hall? Uh, or do you treat him like uh, a janitor? Okay? And believe me, that's the kid that's going to end up being your boss someday. Remember that. Are you practicing being a person of character? Okay. It takes work. It's hard. Again, we all make mistakes. We all screw up. But being a leader of character is hard work. Do you apply yourself? Are you a good friend? And by that I mean not a friend who just says, yeah, whatever, uh, but says, hey man, you're screwing up. Or are you a good tutor? Are you a good tutor? Are you a good teammate? Are you a good colleague? How do you treat the people around you? Do you treat people with respect and do you accept responsibility for your actions? I screwed up. Okay. I got a bad grade because I didn't study for a history test. My fault. So what do you do? You're all leaders. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. You have the privilege of, of uh, enjoying uh, this leader development program here at Riverside. Uh, are you making the most of it? Okay. What do you do to inspire your classmates, your teammates, the folks in your church, the folks in your student club, um, the folks that you hang around with, your siblings, okay? your buddies from back on the block? What kind of role model are you? Remember, ethical leaders may not form. This is work, as Colonel Gallagher said. It's going to take a lifelong of engagement. It's going to take a lifelong of dedication to making yourself that ethical leader uh, who treats everybody with respect uh, that, that you want to be, that you need to be. Okay. So there you go. At the end of the trail, if you remember these four things, okay, you're going to be in good step. No matter what walk of life you go into, you will be, uh, you will be in, in, in good service. People will respect you. Um, people will want to hire you. People will want to work for you and with you. Okay? Uh, and you will assume positions of leadership in your society uh, in the years ahead uh, that will help guide that society in ways that uh, are going to be very, very important uh, if this country is to survive. Okay? If you don't, who will? Somebody else? Not my job? If you have the privilege of taking uh, this truly remarkable develop leader development program uh, here at Riverside, if you know, who will? If not you, then who? Who in your America, who in your cohort, who of your colleagues should do it, if not you? And if not now, then when? When are you gonna start? The day you graduate, too late, sorry. Die if you can. Okay. Do it now. Uh, take advantage of every opportunity that you're afforded here at Riverside to develop intellectually, uh, to develop as a leader of character, uh, so you're prepared for the positions of leadership that this institution is preparing you to accept in the years ahead. Because tell me, let me tell you something. You know, I, you know, I know you're sitting there thinking, hey man, all I want to do is go next week. Give me a break. You, uh, when you graduate from here, going to be a role model. People are going to have expectations of you because you graduated from Riverside Military Academy. More important, you should have expectations of yourself. Who am I going to be? What kind of leader am I going to be? Regardless of what you to go into, always ask yourself, am I doing what I need to do to prepare myself for positions of responsibility in my America? That's your America. Okay. Question, comment, critique, observation, criticism. Yeah, I know you all want to go to lunch. Anybody got a question? <laughs> I'll come see you. I've tried this thing now. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Am I going to Emma? Did anybody hear it? Okay. What did I study at MIT? Um, I'm a 
sort of a nuclear weapons guy, so a little bit of nuclear engineering. Um, I'm also an international relations guy, so I got a degree in international security policy as well. Okay, so um, MIT is a remarkable place. Uh, you, you all have that. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, you all have the opportunity to take advantage of what you, what you have here uh, to really go to your institutional choice. And I don't care what that is. It depends on what you want to do. Um, but actions have consequences. When I was dean at West Point, I used to uh, tell my cadets, and I'll tell you, your transcript is forever. And it will follow you for the rest of your life, uh, particularly now. So the United 10th and 11th and 12th graders, okay, college admissions committees are going to be looking at that document. And so as you're preparing for the term exam, the semester exam, remember this. Okay, because that document will follow you for the rest of your life. Uh, in the short run, it's going to help determine what kind of college you get into. And you all have choices. You're all bright, you're all talented, you're all going to be um, uh, people with self-discipline and leaders of character. My advice to you is aim high, okay? Don't settle. Uh, aim high. You have the opportunity to go to some of the finest colleges in the world uh, because of what you're doing here. Take advantage of it, okay? Don't satisfy. Don't say, yeah, you know, we good enough. Nah, it ain't. Because you're competing with those little geeky guys who are sitting in their basement studying 14 hours a day, okay? Um, you have other layers to your onion that colleges will, uh, will appreciate and will value you. You are more than just another geek. Okay. You have other assets. You have other attributes. The college admissions committees, trust me, because I did this at some point for 200 years. Okay. That, that's why the college is so well in top four. So make your decisions. Okay. And I, you know, I, I appreciate uh, that you're still adolescent males, okay. and you're going to screw up. You're going to connect. We all do, right? Even Colonel Gallagher was an adolescent male at one time, believe it or not. Um, and he probably made some decisions that he was yet. We all screw up. You know, it's just as I say, it's our line in life, adolescent males, and the sign screw up. But recognize it, fix it, don't do it again, right? And don't make it happen. Um, but understand the difference between a trivial screw up, which you guys have studied enough of that yesterday, and making really bad life decisions. Okay? about who you are and how you act and how you treat people. Those are strategic, strategically bad kind of decisions. So you have every option in the world. I know the guy on the top of the campaign is going to be stuck underneath it. You have, at this point in your life, every single available road is open to you. And which road you take is going to depend on one or two things. Either you'll close them off, either by the time you get out of here, you don't have them up. Or you will choose the one that really matters to you. And if you want to go be a nuclear physicist at MIT, go for it. Okay? If you want to be a uh, if you want to be a journalist, go for it. If you want to be a doctor or lawyer, go for it. Doesn't matter. Find your passion and get after it. But it was based on the opportunities that you prepared yourself for here, now. Not next week. Not next month. Not when you get to be a senior. Okay, not second semester, senior year. Now, if you do that, lots and lots of good things are going to happen to you. You have lots of good choices that you want to have. When you leave here, you go to college, or wherever you decide to do, I hope you all decide to go to college. And then in college, uh, you will be recognized as a, as a student leader, uh, and then on whatever profession you find appealing uh, about what you have the passion. So you have every road open to you now, today. Don't close them. Keep them going. Keep your options open. Uh, and trust me, um, you will <coughs> be able to pursue whatever dream that you have. And because you made good decisions, you're a good size, and you're on. Yeah. yeah. General Copeman, uh, we were wondering if you could explain to us uh, what you think lies behind the success of Georgia Gwinnett College, the college that you founded. Uh, okay, well, I, you read that question just like I wrote it. Um, <laughs> I, when I retired from the Army, I remember Paul Goddard said, I, I, uh, I had the privilege of, of, of being the founding president of Georgia Gwinnett College down in Marshall. Um, and uh, we were the first four years, as, as 
Well, I'm sad, the first new four-year college established in Georgia in over 100 years. Um, and so, when I left West Point, um, I had some very strong ideas about the nature of public higher education. Um, and public higher education is the most traditional, the most high down, the most uh, uh, uninnovative endeavor you can imagine. And higher education makes the Pentagon look innovative and flexible, and that's hard to do. Okay. Uh, because they, they're still following a sort of a 17th century model. So we were determined to do it differently. Okay. And you're right. And so, uh, when we built our facilities, we did not build any 300 person classroom at UGC. They're like, the classrooms are like, they are here at Riverside. They're designed to hold no more than about 25 people. Okay. Um, and in most colleges, that's not the way you do it. So when you take freshman English uh, at UGC, you're in it with 20 other kids, and that's all. You're not sitting in an auditorium like this, uh, trying to see some professor way down in the front, you can't see. Okay. Second, uh, we hired faculty only who wanted to be to be to teach and be engaged with students. Okay. Uh, we didn't have tenure. You don't know what tenure is. It's basically a lifetime employment contract for college professors. Yeah, we did not do that. And okay. we said I hired. I interviewed every single faculty member that we hired, and I said, "Don't come here if you don't want to be engaged with students and teach." And everybody teach. So we built uh, the college to focus on student success. Why? Because the nature of the community that we were serving had changed dramatically. Remember that demographic data I showed you about for that county? It wasn't just a bunch of middle-aged white kids anymore. It was an awful lot of young first for whom they were the first ones in their family ever go to college, uh, or for whom English was not their first, or their second, or their third language. I remind you, people aren't illiterate just because they don't speak English, just because they don't speak English. Well, we designed all of our programs to facilitate student success. The college is all about students. It's like real stuff. You might recognize the model, uh, because BDC um, is based on the same model uh, that you all are at the West Point, which is to focus on individual student development. And that's why, that's why it's key. Sir, I have a question right here. Yes, sir. Sir, one of the scariest things a young man these days can be called is a snitch or a snake. Yeah. Uh, can you speak a little bit more to helping us understand why that's actually shouldn't be something we're afraid of doing or being called? Yeah, thanks. Uh, if everybody can hear the question, um, we're all afraid of being called a snitch or a snake or a rat, right? Um, if we if we uh, squeal on our buddies, as it were, it's the second half of your honor code. You know, it's the non toleration clause. Nor tolerate those who do. Um, it's because yeah, and so it, you know, and you think, well, man, I'm just a high school kid. No one will know. Well, first of all, you'll know. Second of all, you're establishing a bad pattern. Um, but believe me when I tell you. Uh, that people make decisions based on what you tell them. And if you lie to them, they'll make a bad decision. And people lie like this. More important, you will make decisions based on what people tell you. And if people lie to you, okay, you will make bad decisions. But if you know, if you are the president of Pennsylvania State University, if you are the superintendent of the amount of public schools, if you are the president of Equifax, that's why I told you all those stories. Terrible things happen. People's lives are affected because you don't want to be a rat or a snitch. Okay. And remember what I told you. If somebody puts you in that position, they don't care about you. They don't. Otherwise, they wouldn't put you in that position. So, you're not a rat. You're not a snitch. You're a leader of character. What you say is, and you don't, you don't have to be um, pedantic about it. I mean, you're not, you're not to be a martin. What you say is, look, you're making a bad decision, and I'm not going to be complicit. I'm not going to be an accomplice in what you're doing. Okay. And so you need to reevaluate the decision you're making. And then the decision is theirs, not yours. Okay. You are not at fault. You are not the snitch. You are the leader of character who said, I think you're making a bad decision. Um, but if they want to go ahead and make that decision, and you're in a position of responsibility and you know about it, guess what? Speak up. <coughs> because bad things will happen to lots of innocent people if you don't. And that will be your fault. And I've seen it happen. I'm not going to tell you a bunch of war stories, but I've seen it happen in, in Vietnam and Cambodia and Iraq and Afghanistan. People who did not tell the truth or who knew something was not true. People made decisions and people got killed because of American soldiers, innocent civilians, you name it. As I said, the same is true to the 
doctor, the same is true if you're an engineer, the same is true if you're a lawyer. Okay? You know about natural behavior, you don't do anything about it, you're at fault. Okay? Um, so make good decisions. That second half of that phrase is important. Did I get the question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right, I know I'm impinging on your lunch hour. Right? Okay, listen, I've been, it's, it's been my pleasure to be here. Um, as, I, as I said, I, I've had the privilege of being uh, associated with Riverside basically since I moved to Atlanta in 2005. Um, it is an experience like no other, as you are enjoying. Um, but trust me when I tell you uh, that the benefits downstream uh, are going to last you the rest of your life. Okay, so take what Colonel Gallagher and the faculty provide you, uh, internalize it, make it part of who you are as a student, okay, as a person, and as a leader, because your country is going to need you. Your country is going to need people like you in the years and decades ahead to help guide us through some very tough times. Okay. Remember what I said, there's nothing guaranteed about uh, the United States of 2050. It will be what you make it. So prepare yourself for position of leadership because you know your community and your state and your nation depend on it. Thank you all. Go Eagles.